Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, well, I just absolutely endorse uh, two things, really. What Aaron said, the need for a multimedia archaeology, and uh, also what Ian said, that uh, we, there's almost everything that uh, requires to be done in this field. Now, I've been involved also about 15 or so years in looking at sound at archaeological sites, uh, but I come from a background of being a painter and a writer, not an archaeologist. There's two ways of, of studying sound at ancient places. Uh, one is to go to them and listen and find out how natural, naturally occurring sound behaves, what's there, sonically speaking. Or you can go and take instrumentation to really explore acoustic parameters. They're not quite the same thing. Uh, like Aaron, I've been involved with both. We've recently done work at the uh, Halsoflini Hypergeum. <laughs> Absolutely swamped with data. Uh, but in the midst of it all, we found a very interesting interpretation of the ceiling art in the oracle chamber there, which will be published in July. Um, and uh, we were 12, 13 years ago looking at resonances, acoustical resonances within uh, chambered monuments, Neolithic chambered monuments. And one of the things that was thrown up from that was that we found a specific frequency had a completely unexpected regional brain effect in the frontal cortex and in the temporal cortex, and that's being explored. But today, I'm simply going to look at some natural sounds, and um, just hoping this is going to work. Um, uh, and uh, as Ian was referring to, their, uh, the common idea of sound and stones are lithophones. I think this is the only 